Welcome to the top 12 highlights from the judicial branch as we look at chapter 13 in the online textbook, chapter 14 in the hard copy textbook. Thanks for joining me. I'm Mr. Rodman here to take you through the top 12 highlights. Here we go. Let's first start looking at the court structure. Remember, uh, the justices that are appointed serve for life, subject to good behavior. They have lifetime tenure, which means they either decide to retire or they die on the bench. Uh, that also means that they're insulated from public opinion. They don't have to worry about what the public thinks thinks about their decisions, about the opinions that they write, about the, um, uh, the, the rulings that come down from the court. Uh, so that really gives them the ability to really look at the Constitution, to really interpret the law. Judicial review is where this concept of interpretation comes from. Uh, it comes from the Marbury versus Madison case from 1803. And um, the idea of ruling on the constitutionality or unconstitutionality of laws, actions, and other um, uh, actions by the government in terms of determining whether uh, the Constitution was followed or whether it was not followed and should be, should be thrown out. Uh, and that includes laws Congress passes, uh, executive orders the president signs, uh, things that states do, and uh, right down to things that uh, the government does against its people. Uh, from police actions, think Miranda v. Arizona, the right to uh, remain silent, uh, as well as Gideon, the right to a lawyer. All of these things come down to this idea of judicial review, uh, reviewing the constitutionality of those laws. Now, we do have a dual court system. We have federal courts and state courts uh, because the, the state courts are handling a lot of the uh, civil cases uh, that we see. They'll also handle a lot of criminal cases. Uh, federal courts are going to look at more constitutional issues, uh, rights violations that go against the Constitution uh, and looking at it from that capacity, as well as uh, crimes against um, the government, uh, federal crime, for instance, uh, a crime against the U.S. government so to speak. So uh, that's more in the federal court. Most of the uh, items that happen uh, would happen in the state court system that would be handled in criminal cases or civil cases uh, and uh, would start in, um, in state courts and kind of work their way up through the appeals court process. Uh, it is an adversarial system. Uh, there are two sides uh, to these decisions. Uh, in these civil cases, uh, we would see the plaintiff uh, and the defendant. In a criminal case, we would see uh, the people, uh, essentially a prosecutor, um, uh, against a, a particular individual or um, that kind of thing. And uh, that would be in criminal uh, cases, uh, the, the state versus whatever. Uh, so you'd have a prosecutor in that case that would be filing uh, the case on behalf of the government uh, against an individual and um, determining guilt or innocence in those cases. Remember, when we get to the appellate courts, and we'll talk about this in a minute, in a minute, the idea here is uh, it is adversarial, but it's petitioner and respondent. They're looking at the constitutionality of, uh, of the laws and actions that the government has taken in some way, shape, or form. And whether it's gone against the people, uh, that really is the, uh, the role there. And, and um, so we see there are two sides uh, being argued before the court. Now, we have a trial versus appellate court. I kind of got into that in the last, um, uh, the last point. But the idea here is a trial court is going to determine guilt or innocence. Uh, not guilty. Uh, the appellate courts are going to look at uh, constitutionality, uh, procedures of the law that are followed according to the Constitution, due process, uh, equal protection, that sort of thing. And then we get to uh, civil um, versus criminal. Again, civil uh, can be between people. Uh, so it's a civil case uh, in terms of, and, and um, uh, divorce is a, a, a very common uh, civil uh, matter that is handled uh, in the courts. Uh, that's uh, person versus person, so to speak, uh, plaintiff versus defendant. Uh, when you get into criminal cases, uh, like I said, that's when um, it's the people versus a particular individual and you're determining guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, there's also a, a concept here that we use in the courts called a plea bargain. Uh, that's where we avoid uh, an actual trial uh, by getting a plea bargain. Um, uh, the the um, uh, the person who's being accused uh, basically pleads guilty uh, to a lesser charge or to the charge in order to get a, a lighter sentence, a lighter punishment. Um, so uh, in some cases, you'll see them plead guilty to something in order to get um, life in prison as opposed to the death penalty or something along those lines. Uh, that's more of a plea bargain in terms of uh, it avoids the uh, 
the uh, all of the uh, proceedings of the trial and allows uh, the government to proceed to judgment, uh, proceed to the, the actual punishment in the case. Uh, we uh, look at the uh, Department of Justice, which is essentially the, the leaders of the law firm that handles all of the uh, government's court cases, uh, whether that's prosecutions uh, handled by the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General, as well as defending the U.S. government in court, which is handled by the Solicitor General. Uh, right now, we have the Acting Attorney General, uh, Jeffrey Rosen. He stepped in for William Barr, who was the Attorney General and, and recently stepped down. Um, he is also uh, working with Deputy Attorneys General uh, in his uh, office in the DOJ, the Department of Justice in Washington, uh, that handles uh, cases all across the country. Remember, there are 94 U.S. district courts in uh, in the country, and there are 94 U.S. attorneys that work for Jeffrey Rosen, that work for the Attorney General uh, in those different districts, uh, both to prosecute cases, issue cease and desist orders, hey, stop doing that kind of thing, uh, as well as um, um, looking at issues that they should be uh, taking forward as legal action against uh, particular companies or businesses or people uh, that are violating the law. So that really is uh, the role of the Department of Justice, and they're they're doing that. Um, in Washington, but also in other places uh, throughout the country uh, and in places like Rockville, uh, in places like Baltimore, as well as places um, like Washington, D.C. The Solicitor General then is really the defense attorney for the U.S. Uh, the US government. They're defending cases, and Jeffrey Wall is the uh, Solicitor General, took over for Noel San Francisco, who was the uh, prior um, Solicitor General. And um, in, in this role, he is essentially um, going before the Supreme Court defending the U.S. government. Uh, if you may recall, Elena Kagan, I mentioned in the overview video, Elena Kagan was Solicitor General uh, under the Obama administration before she was appointed by President Obama uh, to be a, uh, an Associate Justice on the Supreme Court. So a Solicitor General um, uh, is, is arguing on behalf of the U.S. government. It's going to represent the government, as you can see here, in many cases uh, that are coming before for the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, about two-thirds of them, uh, almost two-thirds of them, uh, are cases in which the U.S. government is involved, uh, and usually a uh, defendant in those cases, uh, which is why the Solicitor General is involved here. So a uh, significant role that the Solicitor General plays uh, in the uh, Supreme Court's proceedings as well. Uh, many times uh, they're, they're called the 10th Supreme Court Justice because they're at the Supreme Court so much, uh, it's like they're already on the bench. Uh, but again, they're, they're, they're doing that on behalf of the U.S. government. Um, in terms of the, uh, the roles to be played here, and again, we go over this more in the overview video, but the idea behind this uh, is that we have uh, district courts, uh, and uh, then we uh, we have the uh, the trial courts that we mentioned, the district courts. We have the appellate courts, which are only looking at appeals. Uh, original jurisdiction would start in the trial courts in terms of what we see here. The appellate courts are going to only handle appeals. Um, and uh, those are, again, uh, when you're appealing a case uh, before the court, uh, they're looking at, again, constitutionality. Were rights violated? Were uh, due process rights violated? Was equal protection violated? Uh, was something happening here in which uh, the U.S. government did you wrong? Um, that would be an appellate court issue. And then um, those uh, cases, that are appealed from the appellate courts would go to the Supreme Court. Again, these are things like uh, circuit conflicts, um, state conflicts, uh, things that would go before the Supreme Court could also be uh, conflicts between the branches of government. Executive versus, versus legislative have conflicts. Um, that would be more of an original jurisdiction for the Supreme Court. But mainly original jurisdiction happens in these district courts, in the trial courts that we see here. And again, uh, down here you can see the boundaries. Again, we go over in more detail on this in the overview video, uh, but these are the uh, boundaries for the different uh, regions that we have, uh, essentially uh, a 12, uh, plus the, the D.C. Circuit, uh, plus the uh, federal uh, bench, which is essentially the, the uh, second highest court in the land. Um, we've seen many judges uh, that have become justices on the Supreme Court uh, that came from that federal circuit. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was one of them. Brett Kavanaugh was another. Merrick Garland serves on there now. Uh, so there's a number of, of justices that have come from uh, from that federal circuit. But uh, Neil Gorsuch, as I mentioned, uh, came from the 10th Circuit from the Colorado uh, District Courts. That's where he kind of uh, came up from. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, who came from the uh, Chicago Courts, um, ended up uh, moving up to the, the Seventh Circuit, and that's where she was named by, by President Trump to the, um, to the uh, Supreme Court uh, from that 
uh, particular circuit. So uh, they do come from different circuits, uh, not always from the federal circuit, um, but they do. Um, but many of them serve in, in varying capacities throughout their tenure. Uh, looking at the Judiciary Act of, of 1789, uh, this was the first law Congress ever passed, by the way, um, and it was basically organizing the courts. Congress was uh, the founders and framers knew they wanted to give the Congress the power to organize the courts to kind of frame uh, how the courts would work and to adjust that framework if they needed to over time uh, in order to keep them in check. A really good important, uh, an important check here for the legislative branch to have on the judicial branch to kind of reorganize them if they got out of got out of whack. And so they really wanted to make sure that they had that power. Um, but the Judiciary Act of 1789 essentially established the courts. It determined um, uh, the appellate courts that we saw there, the district courts in terms of how they were organized. And obviously that's been amended and adjusted over time as the country has grown. But the idea is that um, the Congress still holds that power today in terms of reorganizing and could do so at any time uh, if they uh, felt the need or uh, the um, the necessity to be able uh, to need to do that uh, for our court system. Uh, but it is still in use today. Uh, the, the, the Act of 1789 is still in use today in terms of, of that system of district courts, appeals courts, all the way up to the Supreme Court. And those 94 district courts we mentioned are included here as well. Uh, down here in the corner, you see uh, this was the first meeting uh, of the Supreme Court in 1789. Not a whole lot happening. Um, not sure exactly of their role in a lot of cases. Uh, so they didn't really hear any cases until 1792. That's going to going to take a while. And we know Marbury versus Madison didn't come along and until um, until later, 18, what, 1803. Uh, so uh, it's going to take the court a while to kind of get their bearings and figure out uh, what is their role in this new government uh, that's been established. So um, they're going to uh, kind of ease into it. Remember, they uh, when they when they first served, uh, they were in the basement of Congress, uh, so to speak. Uh, they were they were serving in the in the basement of the new Congress. So um, you have to keep in mind that um, the, the uh, Congress may not necessarily have seen them as, as co-equal branches. I mean, Jefferson and Marbury versus Madison didn't like the fact they were even weighing in on the subject uh, because they were concerned it would he would be getting too involved in um, the actions of the president, uh, the executive actions of the president. And, uh, and in that story, we know he won the battle but lost the war uh, in that they were going to be reviewing it on the constitutionality of everything the, uh, the president was going to be doing up to that point and, and moving forward. Now, let's look at some um, uh, situations in terms of number eight here about some Supreme Court cases. It's important to note uh, fewer one, than 1% 1 of the decisions actually are appealed and, and uh, granted uh, to the Supreme Court. So you can imagine the thousands of cases that are out there. Um, and, uh, the, and the tens of thousands that are working their way through district courts, uh, the thousands in appellate courts, and then the you know hundred or so um, that are, are heard each term, uh, usually about 70 to 80 in a term, um, it being uh, anywhere from uh, September to, um, uh, to late April, early May, decisions being announced by June. And um, so less than 1% of the, the cases uh, that are going through the courts, and they take many years uh, in some cases uh, to work through that. Uh, you think about the uh, Marbury versus Madison with 1803, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the president uh, started office in 1801. Uh, so that took two years just uh, to get to the, um, the, the status where it was actually um, going to be heard by the court. That takes a while. Um, so, and, and today is no different in terms of cases that we see. Um, there are There is time in between um, when the case is actually heard in a district court and when it gets to the Supreme Court. That does take some time. Uh, appeals courts hear their cases in bank, which means a three-judge panel is going to listen to that. That also helps them to expedite uh, many cases because a three-judge panel on these circuits that may have, you know, um, you know, 15, 17 judges um, can basically divvy up the work and then uh, hear in these three judge panels and, and rule accordingly. Um, it's important to note uh, that these, um, the people that are, that are appealing these cases, uh, the, the Supreme Court and the uh, appellate courts are really looking uh, for if they have standing to sue. Remember, you have to be harmed in some way by the case you're bringing up in terms of the constitutional issues uh, that you're, 
you're trying to get the court to agree with you on. If you don't have standing to sue, if you don't have skin in the game in terms of being able to uh, argue that case, uh, they're going to throw it out. Uh, they're they're not even going to um, they're they're not going to hear your case. And in many cases, they'll hear the case. Uh, they'll hear the case in order to say you don't have standing to sue, and then they'll throw the case out uh, because they don't want the lower court ruling to stand. They want to hear the case, uh, but they want you to know you don't have standing to sue in this case. And that's also kind of a slap on the wrist to the appellate court saying, why didn't you catch this? Why didn't you catch this and say, hey, folks, you don't have standing to sue? So um, it is kind of a dual purpose in that they would they would hear the case in order to say you don't have standing here uh, and essentially is telling the appellate court that that heard the case earlier, hey, you should have thrown this out back then. Why are we why are we getting to this level where we're hearing it? And then they could just issue stare decisis if that were the case. Uh, the, appell the appellate court basically saying, well, you don't have standing to sue. Even if they appeal it to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court could say stare decisis, we agree with the appellate court, you don't have standing to sue here, move on. Uh, so that is a situation uh, that we have seen time and again with the Supreme Court. Uh, cases are remanded back to lower courts. Gideon did not get uh, did not get out of his uh, his case just because he didn't have a lawyer. Uh, the Supreme Court remanded the case uh, back to the district court uh, for him to stand trial with a lawyer. So they remanded that case back to the lower court in order for them to take action. Uh, and that was where he was found to be innocent. Uh, the lawyer he was granted uh, by the courts because of his uh, the, his being violated of his rights to a lawyer uh, allowed him, uh, his lawyer, to do research and find out that he, in fact, wasn't the person who had broken in uh, to the bar um, vending machine that night and stolen all of the money. So uh, very important, uh, the, the aspect of having a lawyer there he was found to be innocent in that case, uh, but that was a case that was remanded or sent back to the court. Now, it's important to note uh, that when the Supreme Court is looking at cases, they are looking at, not at guilt or innocence, but at the constitutionality of uh, what the government has done in these in these situations, what the government has done in these cases. Um, so has the process been followed? Has equal protection uh, been carried out? Has due process been carried out? Um, have you been violated in some way, shape, or form? And, uh, and this is a problem in terms of why you're bringing it to us. Uh, has a business done something to an individual? Individual and, and the courts have upheld it all the way to here, and it's a violation of the Constitution. That is uh, what the Supreme Court is looking at. So they're looking at the constitutionality, not necessarily the guilt or innocence of people in cases. They're not looking, and they're never going to declare someone innocent or guilty. They're going to declare whether what was done to them was constitutional or not, uh, or what we call unconstitutional. Now, nominations to the court don't happen very often. We've seen three in the last four years, which is an anomaly. That is very rare. There's only nine people on the bench, and I can remember, you know, for a long time in which uh, there there weren't a lot of uh, openings uh, in 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 time. Uh, Jimmy Carter, for instance, served four years in the White House, never made one appointment to the court. Uh, meanwhile, President Trump served four years and made three. Uh, so it it um, you know is a luck of the draw in terms of the the lottery. Um, but the idea here of judicial nominations uh, is that um, there is a, an aspect of, of senatorial courtesy for federal judges, uh, for, for those on the appell appellate courts, on the district courts. This isn't done with Supreme Court nominees, but um, from the districts that they're looking to name, they will, uh, for members of the same party, uh, they will uh, ask those senators from those states uh, for nominations. And a lot of times they'll already have a list and they'll say, you know, who do you like here? Who do you think we should cross off the list is like, um, you know, could be a problem uh, within uh, your district or within that that circuit. Uh, so uh, senatorial courtesy is that practice. Again, we see it uh, with like-minded uh, party members of the president. Uh, so the senator, uh, the senators from the other party uh, usually aren't going to be contacted by the president in, in that capacity. Um, that's more done uh, with um, nominees that are from the same party. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, nomination process, as we have seen, is very political, uh, very much so. Uh, we saw that with uh, Brett Kavanaugh. We saw that with Amy Coney Barrett. Very political process, even with Merrick Garland and Neil Gorsuch. Um, it's a very political process. And um, even though the cases that they're ruling on are uh, that are social issues in which we see such diametric uh, contrasts on the court um, are very small in comparison to all of the cases that they're seeing. Again, they're hearing about 100 cases, uh, uh, less than 100 cases a year. And... Um, 
only a few of those are social issues cases uh, that they're going to be very, very different in terms of their judgment, in terms of their ruling. These are constitutional scholars, uh, many of them former professors, former uh, judges on the bench. Um, they are uh, very schooled in the Constitution. And so um, more often than not, they're all going to be pretty much in agreement on a lot of these constitutional law issues. It's only on the social issues ones uh, that we start to see a lot of, of contrast, as I mentioned. Now, the American Bar Association is going to uh, rate qualified candidates. Uh, they have done this with all the candidates that are on the bench. We've seen that time and again. Interest groups are going to try and influence senators. They're going to influence uh, those uh, parties in order to try and get them to vote one way or another. And we definitely saw that in these uh, these last three nominations. And then the Senate Judiciary Committee is basically going to take up those nominations. Um, that was formerly chaired by Chuck Grassley. Uh, it is now chaired uh, by uh, Lindsey Graham from South Carolina. And... Um, the idea here is that a, a nominee can be stalled through a filibuster in the Senate. A little harder to do that now because you um, the, the threshold is actually lower. Uh, it's now a majority as opposed to uh, more than that. Uh, it used to be 60 votes you needed in the Senate uh, to close a filibuster on a nomination. Um, and that still is the case for, for non uh, judicial um, actions that they're taking in the Senate. Uh, but for judicial nominees, including Supreme Court, Supreme Court nominees, you only need a majority. You only need 51. Uh, so that is a change uh, that was actually done under the, um, uh, for the federal courts, was done under the um, uh, Democratic majority when, when Harry Reid of Nevada was the majority leader in the Senate. Uh, and Mitch McConnell has carried that out in his time as majority leader for the Republican Party in the Senate. Uh, so we continue to see that uh, so the filibuster isn't as isn't as crucial here because again you only need 51 senators and with uh, the Senate being so close in terms of of numbers um, the idea there is uh, that it is um, not impossible to filibuster uh, but harder to do so uh, with that that threshold being uh, so much lower uh, judicial activism versus judicial restraint is our sixth highlight. Uh, the idea of activism, I tried to kind of highlight these in red. Activism is the idea of striking down laws. The Supreme Court's getting involved uh, in terms of striking down a law that they said, you know, violated the Constitution. Uh, they're doing some interpretation here. They, they look at this as a living Constitution. Uh, this Constitution changes over time and context. Um, it doesn't mean in 2021 what it did in 1789 or even in 1971. Uh, so it's very different in that respect. And judicial activism or loose construction is that model of an activist approach, uh, kind of uh, that living constitution and, and the constitution living and breathing and adapting and changing over time. Judicial restraint is more the strict constructionist approach. Uh, this is the idea of textualism, uh, looking at the actual word for word constitution and what it says about this particular law or this particular topic um, and, uh, and going by that and only by that. No interpretation, uh, no uh, no reading into or contextualizing uh, the Constitution in terms of its living and breathing. We don't see that here under under judicial restraint. Strict constructionism is the idea of, of looking at the Constitution for what it actually says, what the word-for-word -word, uh, Constitution actually says in the Constitution, uh, not the idea of what the people thought it uh, was in today's terms. It's more of what the people thought it meant when it was ratified. Uh, when it was ratified in 1789, uh, 1787, excuse me. So um, that's important to note uh, because uh, that is the difference between strict construction and uh, loose construction or activ judicial activism. Uh, and students get that mixed up all the time. But think of activism as uh, you're much more active today in uh, tw the 21st century, 2021, in terms of the, the living and breathing and changing constitution uh, in terms of where it is now. It's an old document, but it's, it's new, it's being reshaped, and it's um, being interpreted in terms of its changes over time. Judicial restraint does not see that. They look at what it said in 1787 plus the the amendments, that's all they're looking at. There's no contextualism. There's no uh, contextualization. Uh, there's no um, additional kind of reading between the lines or reading into it. It is strict construction in terms of the word-for-word -word constitution. What does it actually say about this topic?
okay? And that really is the, the biggest difference. So let's look at some uh, judicial activism in terms of some landmark cases that we have seen. I'll look at three of these uh, that we talked about that are really good examples of judicial activism that we've seen over the last uh, 50, 60 years. Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965 is a good example of this. Uh, this was uh, family planning. Uh, to talk with people about family planning and birth control was a violation of the Connecticut law at the time. And um, the idea here was, again, uh, there was a right to privacy. Now, this is definitely judicial activism, loose construction, uh, because there's nowhere in the Constitution where it says you have a right to privacy. Uh, but by cobbling together uh, free speech in the First Amendment, uh, the uh, the quartering of troops, having to give up part of your home uh, and letting the government come into your home in the Third Amendment, as well as search and seizure rights in the Fourth Amendment, uh, individual rights in the Ninth Amendment, and then uh, this idea of uh, equal protection and the uh, uh, under the Fourteenth Amendment and the right of due process, uh, they basically the the court ruled and said this is a right to privacy. These things, reading between, if we cobble this penumbra of amendments together here. Here, we can see that there is a right to privacy in the Constitution. That is very much a judicial activism approach, if there ever was one. Um, again, a judicial uh, restraint would look at that and say, there is no right to privacy in the Constitution. It doesn't say it in there. It's nowhere in there. We're looking at word for word uh, Constitution and uh, in terms of textualism, and there is none. Uh, so that would definitely be a big difference between judicial activism and judicial restraint. We see that again with Roe. Uh, if there was no Griswold, there definitely wouldn't have been a Roe v. Wade, uh, because without that precedent of Griswold in the right to privacy, you would not have a right to an abortion. Uh, and so that's why, again, this is also judicial activism, because it's built on a precedent of judicial activism. Uh, and Roe v. Wade, looking at that in terms of, well, if you have a right to privacy, you have a right to an abortion. Um, and that was really the the uh, the connection made between the two. And then lastly, we have Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, the idea of precedent here, 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson said segregation is the law. It's constitutional. The Supreme Court steps in in 1954 and says by a unanimous ruling, and they did it, they wanted to be unanimous uh, because they wanted to send a message, uh, which again was going against public opinion at the time because the public wasn't there yet. Uh, but uh, they wanted to say that separate but equal schools are not constitutional. They violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, and they should be outlawed um, and, um, and schools should be um, integrated. And that really uh, was judicial activism of the time in terms of, because again, they're looking at precedent, they're looking at Plessy v. Ferguson and saying, well, the court ruled back in 1896 uh, that, this was, uh, that this was constitutional. And then they go back to um, the Constitution in terms of looking at um, uh, segregation and, and that sort of thing. And it really is looking at the, the uh, contextualization of what the Constitution means in terms of equal protection today. Okay, you go back and look at the Constitution, um, you know, there's the three-fifths clause talking about slaves uh, in the Constitution. So uh, to, con to, to not contextualize it, the Supreme Court is looking at that and saying to not contextualize it in 1954, um, you're, you're missing a whole uh, host of people that weren't free at the time uh, of the writing of the Constitution. But in 1954, um, they are, and they're being violated under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And that really is... Uh, significant here in terms of the role um, that it that it plays out for judicial activism in in the Brown v. Board of Education case. Um, if we go on to number four then, so that kind of closes out our landmark cases. Um, and again, you can go back through the overview video. We go into those cases in a lot more detail if you need them, uh, but we're just trying to hit the highlights here. Um, if we look at number four, the litmus test, again, it, it's not a real test, okay? Uh, does the president ask questions of the nominee? Well, the president could, uh, but a lot, in a lot of cases, they don't need to. And they don't need to because they can look at their paper trail. They can look, uh, many of these are former judges. They're former uh, law professors. They're or former clerks. Uh, and they can look at the paper trail they've established in their careers, and they can see how they would rule on cases. Um, they can look at uh, Elena K as Solicitor General to see how she would uh, argue cases before the court. Uh, John Roberts, same thing, who argued cases before the court. Uh, they can look at Sonia Sotomayor, who uh, was a federal judge 
um, on the bench and, and how she ruled on particular cases. Uh, the same is true of Amy Coney Barrett, of, of Neil Gorsuch, of Brett Kavanaugh, of uh, Clarence Thomas. And you can see uh, the paper trail that these uh, justices have made uh, just by their past rulings. That is the litmus test. That is uh, the, um, the, the paper trail that's been established here. So you don't even have to have a conversation with them about any of that in order to get a feel for how they're going to rule on cases. Uh, you don't need to sit them down and make them take a test. Uh, there's, no, there's no necessity for that. We can just look at uh, what they have done over their careers and get a good sense of the type of justice they will be. And that is how uh, presidents have teams of people uh, that do the research, that go back through all of their, their history, go back through all of their uh, re uh, re uh, reporter interviews and, and um, uh, writings, uh, editorials that they write to newspapers, as well as uh, opinions that they've issued on the courts. All of those types of things um, uh, they can look at and get a pretty good sense of how that judge is going to be on the bench uh, and whether or not they want to um, they want to appoint that particular justice. Then they can sit down with them uh, and they can have an actual conversation with them about that or anything and kind of get to know them and, and see um, if, if they are, in fact, the person that they want to appoint to the court. Uh, so that gives them a lot of leeway just based on uh, doing research. So good research really does help you uh, as, a, as a president here looking for a justice that you want to nominate because it's very easy to be able to do that nowadays because there's such a paper trail behind all of the justices in terms of their careers. Okay, look, let's look at uh, some court procedures here for a second. Uh, so we talked about the, uh, the, the cases uh, that are appealed to the court and um, some, some terminology to use here. Uh, writ of certiorari is this petition uh, that, they, that you want to appeal to, uh, to the, the appeals court or to the Supreme Court uh, your ruling in the prior case. Um, and you want to appeal to the court for a particular reason. Something's unconstitutional, you believe it, in, or, or you believe you've been wronged in the previous court, and you want to appeal to them to hear the case because of that. Again, it's not guilt or innocence, it's, it's constitutional or unconstitutionality. Uh, informal pauperis is where Gideon actually used, and, and, and by the way, uh, this happens quite often. They get uh, hundreds of, of um, uh, writs of certiorari uh, that, that are written by inmates, uh, people in prison uh, that are writing these cases. Uh, when I was a teacher fellow up at the court uh, a few summers ago, uh, I asked that question and uh, we heard from uh, the, uh, the, the clerks uh, that are working on uh, Informa Pauperis uh, in terms of working with inmates to uh, to file their writ of certiorari uh, with the court. And many of them don't have the money to do it. Informa Pauperis means basically I'm, uh, I'm, I'm writing the form as a pauper. I don't have the money to file the fee, to pay the filing fees in order to file this petition. And obviously they are able to do that because our, our system is not about money, but about uh, making sure that everybody has the right uh, the, the same rights under the law. So informal pauperis is another way that prisoners can petition their cases to the court. Now, unfortunately, um, not all those cases, most of those cases are never heard from uh, the court. Uh, but Gideon was one of the lucky ones uh, in which uh, he was heard, and that has actually been a clarion call for a lot of prisoners to be able to petition their cases to the court. Uh, rule of four is uh, uh, applicable here. You got to have four Supreme Court justices to sign on to grant a writ of certiorari. Uh, the idea of, of granting uh, this writ of certiorari or granting the uh, ability to hear the case. We want to see the writings, uh, the certifications of the court in order to um, in order to hear more about the case. It doesn't mean they're going to rule to overturn the case. Uh, they may end up saying you don't have standing, throw the case out. Uh, but rule of four says uh, we're going to grant writ of certiorari, show us the certifications, show us the writings of the previous uh, documents uh, of the previous courts, uh, give us the uh, the briefs, give us the amicus briefs, let's hear what they have to say and, and then we'll uh, sit down and make a, a decision based on that. Now, remember, uh, they're only looking at questions of constitutionality, okay? So uh, this includes, is it constitutional in terms of what's happening here, uh, or is it a violation of federal law uh, in terms of what's happening here? Uh, so uh, one of the court cases that they heard this past term uh, that Neil Gorsuch and Roberts uh, were the deciding votes on, um, it was a, I want to say it was a six to three ruling, uh, was on the Civil Rights Act and if it applied to uh, non-discrimination for gay people uh, and do they have the right uh, to be able to 
um, uh, under the Civil Rights Act, do they have the, the same rights as others? Uh, and uh, the court came back and said uh, that that was a violation of federal law uh, to not include, because it's sex discrimination is basically what they said, uh, because under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, you have uh, the, the right to... Um, uh, to not be discriminated against based on uh, race, creed, ethnicity, uh, sex was one of them. And uh, they said that sexual, um, uh, that, that uh, sex discrimination, uh, sexual orientation was included in the, in, um, in the coverage of sex discrimination, uh, which uh, was a significant change to federal law uh, in terms of that point. So uh, it's not just constitutionality, but also federal law there that, that's important in terms of uh, in, in terms of the cases that they look at. Now, uh, keep in mind that they're going to get uh, appeals, applications for appeals, uh, these writs of certiorari by, uh, you know, the thousands, but they're only going to hear a small few, you know, up to and including 100 on a busy, busy year. Usually it's about 70 to 80 uh, that they're going to hear. And those cases are going to usually involve states uh, that are in conflict, circuits that are in conflict. Uh, they're going to hear from the branches that may be in conflict, executive and legislative, that kind of thing. And then uh, also, uh, again, obviously violations of the Constitution. Now, when uh, the oral arguments have finished, at the end of the week, they have the Friday morning conference. We talked about this in class, uh, but the idea here is on Friday mornings uh, at 10 a.m., the nine justices uh, join the uh, most elite club in the country. Uh, you have to have a presidential appointment and Senate confirmation in order to get into the room, and only those nine are in the room uh, for this discussion. Uh, they're going to talk about the cases they've heard. Everybody gets a chance to speak once before anybody gets to speak twice. Uh, everybody is taking notes, uh, and there are only justices in the room. Uh, so the, uh, the rookie, uh, the newest member of the, um, of the court is going to get the door. They're also going to take the notes uh, for the uh, justices. And then uh, the, the chief justice is going to tally up the votes in terms of how uh, the, the, uh, the opinion is shaping up. Uh, it's by no means final, uh, but how it's shaping up in order to determine who's going to be writing the majority opinion. Uh, the chief justice, if he is of the majority, will assign that majority opinion uh, to someone in the majority. And uh, if the chief justice is not in the majority on this opinion, uh, then the senior most member of the majority uh, would assign that to a member of the majority uh, writing that opinion. Now, it's important to note, many times uh, the dissenting opinion may become the majority uh, because they circulate these opinions over the course of months uh, as they're working through these uh, these different opinions on these, these 80, uh, 70 to 80 cases that they're looking at. So there's a lot of different opinions going on all at the same time. And they're doing all this in confidence, behind closed doors, uh, very hush-hush. Um, but what ends up being the, um, the opinion of the court is the writing for the majority. Uh, the idea of the majority opinion here is anything that is 5 to 4, 6 to 3, 7 to 2, 8 to 1, or 9 to 0 uh, would be the majority opinion. Um, and um, if there is a case in which someone recuses themselves and the, the uh, opinion comes down 4-4, then there is no ruling on this case. It is, uh, they defer to the, uh, the appeals court uh, decision, and uh, then, then they would essentially be deadlocked in that 4-4 four four decision. So obviously they want to have a majority opinion coming out. Uh, that is uh, that that involves all nine of the justice where po justices where possible, uh, so that they don't get into a deadlocked uh, 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 opinion in that particular decision in that particular case. Now, a concurring opinion is somebody who's voting with the majority, uh, but doing it for different reasons. Uh, so maybe you want to make your reasons known as to why you're voting with the majority, but it differs from what the majority opinion has actually stated. And we see this a lot, uh, where justices want to spell out why they made the case for this in addition to where the majority went with it. Uh, dissenting opinion, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was famous for these. I dissent uh, was kind of her catchphrase. And um, the idea here was uh, many of those dissenting opinions that she wrote um, became uh, majority opinions. Um, and we don't know how many, uh, but we know that uh, she was able to use her legal arguments to win over some uh, swing voters on the court over time, over the years that she spent on the bench. And so um, thus the importance of a dissenting opinion. If uh, the dissenting opinion can win over just one or two uh, justices to uh, the majority, it becomes the majority opinion. Uh, and so that can make a significant difference. Uh, justices don't have to write a dissenting opinion. Uh, 
they can if they want, and they don't always do it on every case uh, in which they dissent, uh, but they are, uh, they are able to do that and, uh, and able to issue that. And then all of these opinions will be issued at the same time whenever the case is decided and the decision is rendered or, or announced to the court. Uh, usually that's done in the courtroom. Uh, but not always. Sometimes a per curiam opinion. Uh, sometimes a, a decision is is announced uh, without an opinion. Uh, that would be a per curiam opinion, um, uh, and, or with a or uh, uh, would also be a decision is announced with an opinion uh, that isn't signed by a particular justice. Uh, they've just kind of come out with a blanket statement as to why they they ruled the way they did. Now it's important to note uh, the idea of the p word precedent uh, because they are looking at the Constitution. They are looking at how the courts have ruled. And it doesn't mean that they're always going to rule that way, um, but it does mean that they are uh, definitely looking at precedent in terms of how the previous courts have ruled. Now, we know with Plessy versus Ferguson and, and Brown v. Board uh, that Brown, the, the court in Brown uh, look, may have looked at precedent, but they didn't regard it as being um, the law of the land uh, in terms of how the court ruled in 1896. Um, contextualizing in terms of 1954, they looked at it and said, hey, uh, the Constitution needs some updating here. Um, the, uh, the the idea of school segregation is unconstitutional. And so that uh, is where they kind of left, uh, they left precedent and, and what took uh, what took precedence over uh, the historical precedent was really uh, the idea of, of contextualizing uh, the idea of equal protection under the 14th Amendment. So, uh, but stare decisis is this idea of precedent, uh, looking at precedent and basically uh, letting the lower decision stand. Uh, we don't want to get involved with this because we see uh, that the other courts did it right. Uh, the lower courts looked at the case and said, hey, based on previous rulings, based on precedent, uh, we're going to let that decision uh, stand based on what we see here, uh, there's no need to, uh, for us to take further action. And the Supreme Court would stand the decision and would say stare decisis in those particular cases uh, because they don't see a need to overrule them, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that they're not going to overturn decisions. Uh, they've done that in many cases um, in terms of uh, cases they've looked at, but they really do rely on precedent in terms of, uh, of it determining uh, cases and, and constitutional law in terms of what we see today. Our first and final highlight uh, for this chapter is checks on judicial power. You'll notice here that Congress has a lot of power over the courts. Uh, they can reject nominees as well as approve them. Uh, the Senate has the control here in terms of advice and consent. Uh, they can alter the jurisdiction of the courts. They can alter the makeup of the courts. They can alter and, and amend the Judiciary Act of 1789 in order to do that. Uh, they can also impeach, hold a trial, and remove justices. Impeachment would be held in the House. The trial and conviction would be held in the Senate. Uh, and then removal of the justices would result from that. Um, and then they can also amend the Constitution if they want to overturn a decision that the court has made. And many of them uh, have have done this or have, uh, or at least proposed bills uh, that have made their way out of this uh, in terms of, of court decisions that have been made. And so Congress has the power to check the judicial branch in these capacities, in, in these roles that we see here. Now, the president also has some checks. Uh, in addition to nominating judges, uh, the president can also use the media and public opinion uh, to try and drive a wedge uh, between uh, what the court is doing and what it should be doing. Uh, FDR tried to do this during the New Deal when they they were de the Supreme Court was declaring a lot of his um, New Deal agencies and, and actions to be unconstitutional. He said, let's expand the court. Let me uh, pack the court with a bunch of people. Uh, that ended up uh, serving as a chilling effect on some of the uh, justices to kind of take a step back and, and, um, and go, whoa, 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 okay, maybe we need to... Maybe we need to take a closer look at this and rethink it uh, and, and the role that they play there. Uh, but the president does have the power to uh, use uh, public opinion uh, to his advantage uh, and, and to the court's disadvantage in that. Uh, usually justices don't speak to um, the media. They don't give interviews. Uh, they're not sitting down on Sunday morning talk shows. Uh, and so the president has that advantage and the president's surrogates, uh, the people that work for the president and go on all of those news shows, uh, do have the advantage to kind of garner and, and and solicit public opinion to try and uh, get them to support them in these efforts. And then um, notice that uh, the, the court can rule on a decision, but it's the executive branch that carries out the law. And so if the court rules uh, something is constitutional or unconstitutional, it really comes down to the president and the executive branch to enforce those decisions or not to enforce those decisions. Um, and this was uh, Andrew Jackson, I believe, uh, basically uh, saying that... Um, 
the uh, you know the Indian removal was a violation of the the Constitution, and and Andrew Jackson said, yeah, we'll let them enforce it. Uh, good luck with that, right? Um, and so this is a, a a check. This is a a difficult situation because the courts don't have uh, police officers. They don't have military. Uh, it is the executive branch that handles those types of things. And so that is a check on judicial power. That is a a uh, a check there on the, the powers that they have. Now, some other limits, uh, just to mention, uh, Supreme Court and, and the courts that we're talking about, uh, the district courts the, the, uh, in the uh, 94 jurisdictions, uh, don't initiate cases. Uh, the cases come to them, okay? Uh, again, we talked about the idea that they have, don't have enforcement powers, but it's important to note that the cases have to come to them. The Supreme Court doesn't go searching out for cases. Uh, they may go uh, talk about uh, the types of cases they'd be looking at, Alito and uh, Sam Alito and Clarence Thomas did this uh, back uh, a few months ago, looking at particular cases that they wanted to review and kind of said that to a, an audience, um, a, a legal audience uh, in, in a lecture they were giving, uh, which is very rare. We don't usually see justices, sitting justices actually doing that. Um, but again, uh, they're not initiating those cases. The cases are going to work their way through the system and, and work up uh, through the, the ranks of the system in order to, to do that uh, because uh, their power is only to grant writ of certiorari to hear those cases. Um, they also um, may not care about public opinion, but they also don't want to stray too far away from it. Um, they, you know, they, they are insulated from public opinion, but that still doesn't mean they don't have to live with public opinion day in and day out. And uh, in terms of uh, where the court's going to go with that, they try not to stray too far from that public opinion uh, because they want, um, and, th and they enjoy some of the best approval ratings of any of the three branches um, that are out there. Gallup poll, is, has, um, and, and I showed you some of this in the overview video, the, uh, the Gallup polls have shown the judicial branch is one of the highest regarded branches of our government and has over, you know, a hundred years or so since they've been taking those polls. Judicial branch is the one that usually fares the best. Uh, so while they don't look at public opinion in terms of determining their constitutionality of the law, uh, they definitely don't want to stray too far away from that. Um, they do want to follow stare decisis, the idea of following precedent in terms of trying to uh, not stray too far uh, from the Constitution and from the law. And that's whether it's judicial activism or judicial restraint. Uh, they do try and keep it within the bounds of the Constitution. Uh, but the biggest limitation to them is the Constitution. Uh, because again, you can only do what the Constitution says you can do. And even though you're interpreting uh, either strict construction or loose construction, judicial restraint or judicial activism, uh, you are still bound by the Constitution to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And that is a, a severe limit in terms of doing your job, do, focusing on what the Constitution says. Whether you're interpreting it or not is, is up to you. Whether you're textualism or whether you're loose construction, again, that is up to the, the justice in terms of their jurisprudence. But the idea here is um, that their, their biggest limit is they must focus on the Constitution and ruling on the constitutionality of those laws, executive orders, and actions. I hope you found this helpful uh, in terms, and this closes out the top 12 highlights for the judicial branch. Good luck on your upcoming quiz, test, semester test, or AP exam. Live the five.